Hey, welcome to another lesson in our information security class. We're going to be talking about encryption here. My name is Shad Sluter, and I'm a professor at Grand Canyon University. In our types of cryptography that we're studying, we've talked about classical Caesar shifts. We've talked about the modern algorithms called AES and DES. Also, we've talked about asymmetric ciphers, which uses a private and public key. In this video, we're going to talk about hashing, specifically about hashing documents and about hashing passwords. So let's get started. In the first part, we're going to talk about using document hashing for accuracy. So this is for security, maybe in legal documents, and where places where you download things that you do not trust. So maybe software that might have malware in it. Now the second part of the video is about using hashing to increase your security when you're creating an application and using passwords. Now to understand what hashing is, think of it as a digital signature. So every document that you can create can be verified to see if it's been modified or not. So for instance, let's say you have a document or maybe a program. Let's say it's an executable file that is a downloadable from an open source software. But anyway, we're going to talk about it as a document. We run this document through a hashing function and the resulting product of that function is a string that is supposed to be unique. There should be never anyone else like it in the world. Only that document gets this hashing link string. Now the string is not the full length of the document. It's just a maybe 50 or 100 characters. If you send the document and the hashing results to your recipient on the internet, they can receive the document, run the hashing function, and to check to see if the document hash is the same. So document verification happens sometimes when you're downloading software. This is the Ubuntu website where you can get the free version of an open source operating system and never see Windows or Mac again in your life. So if you want to check to see if that uh, operating system is actually the one that you thought it was, you can verify it with a hash. And so they have instructions here on how to use SHA or SHA SUM in the uh, verification of the file. So just because you click download doesn't mean it came from the right place. Make sure that you verify things before you install them, or so they say. Most of us just download and install and never even question the fact that we could be getting malware. But the theory is, if you do a hash on a document and it doesn't match, match what the original author said it was, then you've got some malware and you need to delete it. Here's some examples of what hashing would look like. If you were to have a programming language like Python or C-sharp and you would use the hash function, you would certainly just give it a string such as hello and it would produce a long random string or seemingly random string back to you. And you can see that each word that we hash comes up with a different result that has no relation to the previous one, even though there might be just one letter changed. There's also different ways that you can hash a document. So you could at the command prompt in your Linux machine, you could type these commands and it would tell you the hash for the document. Hashing is not a new idea. So famously, the documents of the Old Testament were kept very closely by Jewish rabbis. They would make copies by hand for centuries without any errors in them. And the way that they did it was sort of a hashing technique. So for instance, they would take the page and count the letters on the page. They would count the columns. They would make sure that there was a consistent number on the page. So just summing up the letters would be one way to check to see if they had made a mistake. And if they did make a mistake, they would not try to correct it. They would just throw away the page. Also, they would maybe look at the middle letter of the document. And so they were very, very tedious in how they copied. And their track record was very good. So that over centuries, they would have literally no changes from the original because they believed that they were copying the very words of God and they had to be extremely careful. So we should be doing the same thing with our computers. We don't have to count letters like they did, but we can certainly do something far more accurate. It's important to know the difference between encryption and hashing. So hashing is not encryption. If you look at the example on the left, this is an example of an encrypted email. So it's, it's somewhat long. You can see that there might be 500 letters in it or more. So this was about one paragraph of text. Now, if you were to hash a single word, you would get maybe 50 letters back in your hash. But if you were to hash an entire book or an entire file, you would still only get 50 letters in a hash. And so you can see that the hash is not a encryption. The hash is just a unique signature that goes uniquely with that word or with that file. A second way that encryption is different than hashing is that the reversibility of it is, is only on one side. 
So the point of encryption is to send a message that can be reversed back into English or whatever language. The hashing process, though, is one way. So if you hash a word, a password, or a book, you will get a hash value. You can't take that hash value and then find out what the original was. That's not the point. Hashing is a one-way process. A third way that encryption is different than hashing is that encryption always produces a unique file. Hashing always produces a unique file. Well, theoretically it does. But if you have a hashing algorithm that is not very rigorous or very large in its hashing, there could be a same uh, hash collision, you would call it, where different documents produce the same signature. Very, very rare, but it's theoretically possible. That is because of something that you can think of as the birthday problem. So here's the question on the birthday problem. How likely is it for two items to produce the same hash result? That's really the same question. So if I asked you, there's a room full of 30 people, what is the likelihood that two of those people in the room share a birthday? Now, it doesn't mean that they all have the same January 1st birthday, but just any two have a same birthday. Because really, a birthday is like a hash. So if I said birthday hash Tim, Tim was born on January 1st. If I said birthday hash Teresa, she would give me 365 because she was on the last day of the year. Birthday, Tom, birthday hash uh, Thomas, Thomas was born on February 1st, so we'll give him a number 32. So that a hash in the birthday problem is really to say there are 365 possible results and everyone's going to be uh, mapped to one of those dates. So you can see that it would be possible for two people to share a same birthday. So it's a hash function that's really not very rigorous. Now, if we were to take a hash function and try to use it for fraud, this would be the plan of attack. So let's say that Mallory and Bob are trying to do some kind of a financial transaction. And they sign a contract, and they're emailing the contract using a Word document. And so, uh, let's see, Mallory always seems to be the one that is the bad person. So the original document was said that the agreement was she's going to sell something for $1,000. However, she wants to trick Bob into paying, uh, looks like, a million dollars. So what's she going to do? Well, here's how she would exploit it. She gets the original document that was agreed upon for $1,000. And then she goes through a program that slightly changes the document. So she could go and just insert a space or remove a comma or change a letter or an indentation. Some bit or byte in the document is modified. And then she does this a million times. And so she has a, you know, a countless numbers of hashes to work with. So she has a large collection of hashes that are all different, but they, they look a lot like the original document. The uh, Bob would never notice the differences. Now, she wants to take a fake document. So she goes in her bad way and changes the number 1,000 to the price tag of a million. And now she goes to the hashing machine and she says, I'm going to change all the same kind of things. I'm going to make millions of changes by adding a comma, putting a space, uh, changing a detail that doesn't really affect the, uh, the, the appearance of the document, but it does actually change the document. And so now she has this huge collection. If she gets lucky, she can compare the results of the brown documents to the red documents. And just by luck there happen to be two of them that hash to the same value. Like I said, it's very, very unlikely. But if your hashing function isn't very strong, it's like the birthday problem. There could be two people with the same hash results. And so, if she gets the two to match, then she can use this as fraud. So here's what she does. She gives Bob a document, he signs it, and then she has an alternative document that appears to be signed by Bob, but it's a completely different amount. And so in court, she might say, hey, Bob signed it, it was a million dollars, he owes me the money. So it's kind of a long reach that this would actually happen. Hashing's pretty good, but if you didn't have the proper hashing method, then this could actually theoretically happen. So of course, you want to have a good hashing method. So how do you avoid having collisions? Well, you can avoid it by making your hashes longer. And so that the probability of two hashes coming together and being the same are absolutely zero. So look at the blue hash document. It is a long, long hash value. So the possibilities of all the combinations of letters and numbers at that many digits is infin it's infinite. You know, there's really no choice or chance 
that two documents will actually hash to the same value. So what could Bob do to, to protect himself? Well, he could have a really big hash value, but he could also do the same thing. He could say, okay, Mallory sent me this document to sign. So he says, I'm going to make one small, small change. He says, I'm going, to, I'm going to slip in an exclamation mark somewhere. And then he signs it and sends it back to her. And suddenly she doesn't have the original document that she could have worked with, and so he has protected himself by modifying the document. Now let's talk in the second part of the video about what a more common way is of hashing that you would probably see as a programmer. Password hashing. It's used everywhere and all the time. And so here's how it works. So you take an original password and then you run it through a hashing algorithm and you save the hash. So you put it into the database. You never, never want to store a clear text password in your database. You're just asking for trouble if you do. So really a hashed password is almost like encryption because you can't really tell that hello maps to this actual hash value. You can't go with the reverse either, so you're going to have to do some programming to figure out how this person can log in. So let's say the person logs in with the password of world instead of hello. And so you run through your hashing algorithm and you get this orange value here that says ER4A46, etc. Now in the database, there was a hashed value stored when the guy created his password to begin with. Hello, let's say. And the hello hash doesn't match with the world hash. So if the hash doesn't match, then you know that he didn't provide the right password. And so you're verifying by comparing hashed values. So you never actually know what the original password was, but you can tell that their passwords don't match because their hashes don't match. So here's some code that would be from the PHP language to show how you could uh, hash a password. So you just type in the word hash, type in the algorithm name, and then the phrase and now you will store a value that looks nothing like the original password. This is what it would look like in Python. You, you can use a library called HashLib, and it works the same way, where you have a digest, it's called, and it produces a unique hash for the string. Here's a programming tip. So if you're building an application and you're verifying whether the user typed in the password and login name correctly, don't tell them which one failed. Just tell them that one or the other failed. Because if you tell them that they got the right password, but they got the wrong username, well, that's a great way that they can just find out who, who that belongs to, and vice versa. If they got the right username, all they have to do is guess half of it. So you want to tell them that one or the other failed, but never tell them which one. Now, in the world of hashing, you've got lots of choices to pick from. So I've got a column of MD5, SHA-1, and SHA-512. Now, each of these has a unique signature, and you can see just by a quick glance that MD5 hashes are quite short in comparison. So if you guess that the right column is the most secure, you're correct. So a longer hash is more difficult to crack. As a matter of fact, MD5 should never be used anymore, which you'll see in a few minutes. Here's how a hacker typically has to steal passwords. First of all, he breaks into a computer system and downloads all of the user accounts. What he gets is just a, a list of names and a bunch of hashes. So he doesn't actually see the passwords. But then he goes through each one in the list, and at the leisure of having the document on his computer, he can guess. He can guess as many times as he wants, millions of times. And you just say, I'm going to compare the hash results that I get from generating random passwords to the results that were stored in the database. So if I generate a random password and the hash matches what was stored in the database, I know what that password was. So if you guessed a match, you've guessed the password. So just to show you how MD5 is not really secure, let's take a, an example here. So let's say I want to uh, make up a password and see what the hash looks like. So let's say I'm a Rockets fan. I type in the word Rockets for my password and choose Generate. And the password should come back. Here is my password. It's the hash. So if I stored that in the database, it should be secure. You can't really tell that that came from rockets. Or can you? Let's do a Google search for the hash and see what comes up. So it says here, the first result is rockets. How in the world did they know rockets came from here? So let's go check through the list and see what would be interesting in our, uh, in our results. Let's take a look at this one. It's called requested MD5 hash Q. So it looks to me like this is a service set up to do hashing for you. And you can see that uh, Rockets was submitted by somebody else way back in 2011, and the results came back. And so these people are just a service to crack passwords, it appears. 
And so how many passwords have they got? Over 3 million, it looks like. So anything that's already been cracked is listed here. So there are no secrets to MD5 hashes. As a matter of fact, there are password tables that are already created for you. You can download your list of tables right here. It says uh, projectrainbowcrack.com. Uh, and so what this is, is a list of pre-cracked passwords. The MD5 hash is listed out in a gigantic text file. And all you have to do is do a, uh, do a search for any, any hash that you have. And it'll bring it up for you. So hackers probably have hard drives that are just full of rainbow tables of known passwords and the hashes that go along with them. So even if a hash takes a long time to generate, uh, they've already done the work ahead of time for common passwords. So that should give you some fear to say, never use a password that is all lowercase letters or a word, a common word. It's already been cracked many years ago and you're just, they're just waiting for you to use it. So how do you defeat a rainbow table? Well, there are certain techniques and the best one is called salting a password. So salting means that you add a unique number before the password and then hash it. And so that way it doesn't fit into anybody's pre-computed rainbow tables. Now, salting is kind of a strange word. It doesn't mean that you make the, the flavor better or you preserve it. The word salting here, I think, comes from the idea that in the uh, ancient times, if you invaded a country and you wanted to destroy their land and make it unusable for agriculture, you would just dump a bunch of salt on it, and therefore it was useless. And so now you can do the same thing with your password. So let's look at the example of hello. So hello is obviously a bad password to choose from. So if I hash hello, I'm going to have a result that everyone knows. However, if I hash hello and I add to it a random string, I get something else. Well, what random string should I choose? Should I make a difficult one to pick from, or can I just pick something that I already know? Well, the answer is that you don't have to make your salt private. It can be stored in clear text, it can be very easy to use, but it will defeat a rainbow table. So how you can create salt is you can pick something like the system date on the computer, or the IP address that they're working on, or the MAC address, or just use a random function. You can use any ki kind of value that you want, but you just make sure that you capture it when the password is created and save it, and so that way the hashing still works, even though it can't be pre-computed. So the benefits says that the hackers can still use brute force. They can still go through every possible combination in the universe, and they'll eventually crack your password, but they can't use their pre-computed rainbow tables. Salting also prevents two users from having the same hash. So for instance, if people use the word secret in their password and you add a salt to it, well obviously that makes a hash that is different and it can't be used in the rainbow table. So salting is a great technique that you should use if you're using password hashing. So here is what your code would look like, no matter what kind of software you're writing, if you were going to create a password and hash it. So first of all, you get the username from the, from the user. Then you create a, a, get a password from the user as well. And then come up with salt, some random number, and then concatenate those two strings together, and then run it through the hashed function, and then save it into your database. So that's what you'd want to do if you want to create salted passwords. So in summary, let's talk about the things that we've learned. First of all, document hashing is used to ensure accuracy. So before you download a piece of software, you can check to see if it's been modified in any way. Password hashing is used to increase security. Obviously, you don't want clear text passwords in your, in your dictionary or in your database. And also, you don't want to use uh, password hashing routines that are old. So avoid the MD5 if at all possible. Also, it's important to uh, distinguish between hashing and encryption. Encryption is a method for encoding information. Hashing is a method for identifying it. So as we leave, just uh, one joke to, to lighten your day and they are burying their pet. And Olive, though you are no longer with us, you know that you will always be in our memories as a password. So thanks for watching. There's hundreds of other videos on my channel. As a professor at Grand Canyon University, I teach programming and computer security and computer science. And so you can get your entire degree right here on YouTube just if you browse around. Thanks for watching.